Some people, they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an attribute called a saq. Saq, with the qaf on the end, people translate it literally as being a shin. So you find some translators, they literally translate the word saq into shin. It's mentioned in the Quran, Surah Al-Qalam, Yawma Yakshu An Saqin, that uh, a day when the saq will be uncovered or unveiled, a day when the saq will be uncovered or unveiled. Note that I'm not giving you a translation of the word saq, though people translate it as being a shin, why I'm not giving you a translation of it literally is because you will find narrations going back to the Sahaba like Abdullah ibn Abbas, some of his students like Sa'id ibn Jubair, other tabi'in like Ibrahim al Nakhai, giving what's known as a ta'wil, a figurative interpretation of As-Saq, mentioned in Surah Al-Qalam, verse 42. And the ta'wil, the figurative interpretation given by Ibn Abbas and others, is that Saq here means a dire matter. A dire matter, a severe matter will be uncovered on that day, meaning the day of judgment. Not that literally something known as a shin will be unveiled for people to see in the hereafter on the day of judgment. Now some people, they say that saq mentioned in this verse, Surah Al-Qalam, is an attribute of Allah. And the way they derive that, and this is the argument of Ibn Taymiyyah and his school of thought, is that there is a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari. This will be interesting for you because remember there was a question, is everything in Sahih al-Bukhari considered to be authentic or not? The general principle is that inshallah everything is in there, everything that's within it is authentic unless proven otherwise by a master of hadith. One thing I didn't mention last time when this question arose, I was reading Dr. Mustafa Azim's book on hadith, one of his books on hadith, there are several. One, one of the works he's written on hadith, he mentioned in there that scholars of the past, they criticize Sahih al-Bukhari, some, I'm not saying all or the majority, some scholars criticize Sahih al-Bukhari for this reason, that there are around 80 narrators who are impugned by other scholars of hadith from the days of Bukhari. There's about 80 narrators in Sahih al-Bukhari who are somewhat impugned. They have some form of jar on them. And he also mentioned, Dr. Azmi mentioned, there's about 110 hadith apparently where this subject or difference of opinion on the grading, the final grading. So al-Bukhari included them. He considered them to be sahih. And they fulfill his conditions, but to other scholars, there's problems with up to 110 narrations in Bukhari due to about 80 narrators. And then again, the other side of the argument is that what Bukhari included can be shown to be authentic if you look at what's known as a type of work known as al mustakhraj If we go back to Sahih al-Bukhari, for your reference, if you have the famous English edition translated by Mohsin Khan, if you look at volume 9, page 395, to 399, number 532. So it's a very lengthy hadith, volume 9, page 395 onwards. It's number 532, the Muhsin Khan edition. There's a very lengthy hadith about what will occur on the Day of Judgment, going back to the famous companion, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. And as part and parcel of this lengthy hadith, one portion of the hadith, it mentions, فَيَكْشَفُ an saqihi. That so Allah will uncover his shin. In the possessive form, his shin. This is the way it's been translated. His saq. Okay. So they utilize this narration from Sahih Bukhari to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has affirmed for himself an attribute called a saq, a shin. So on the surface, because it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, people are going to think, how can you argue against that? This is definitely a Sahih hadith. And it must be from the words of the Prophet ﷺ. And so therefore we should affirm an attribute called as saq or shin as people translated it. Literally for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not give any figurative interpretation. That's the second condition that they add. So how do we look at this chain or how do we look at this text? We look at the commentators of this narration. People like Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Not the lower ranking people, some of them are generally self-taught. We don't look at these people. We look at Hufaz of Hadith and see how they've commented on it. If you look at the chain of transmission for this narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, 
It comes through a narrator known as Saeed ibn Abi Hilal. You can take that down if you want. Saeed ibn Abi Hilal is found in the chain of transmission. Now Saeed ibn Abi Hilal, his teacher, the person he narrated this hadith from, he is known as Zaid ibn Aslam, who is also a trustworthy narrator. Now Saeed ibn Abi Hilal is generally a trustworthy narrator. But if we go back to the books dealing with Jar and Ta'adil, one of the last works, major works dealing with Jar and Ta'adil is Tahdib al Tahdib of Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, which is based on earlier works. So if we look under his biography, you will find that most scholars have authenticated him, have praised him. Okay, this is known as Tawthiq, giving accreditation. They've declared him to be trustworthy, but apparently there were some scholars who did find some mistakes in Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal's narrations. So one of those people of later times who said that Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal had errors was Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri from the 5th century. Ibn Hazm al-Zahiri declared Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal to be not strong, Laysa bil Qawi. And then he also mentioned that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said that Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal, he would sometimes confuse his narrations. This is known as ikhtilat, confuse his narrations, meaning the wording of the hadith. Sometimes he would narrate it in one way, and another time in a different way. But this narration from Ahmad ibn Hanbal is authentically related from him in a separate work. Now, Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal is not the only person who narrates this hadith from Zaid ibn Aslam. There are at least five other people who narrate from Zaid ibn Aslam this same hadith, going back to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. One of them is Hafs ibn Maysara. We find the same hadith in Sahih Muslim from the root of Hafs ibn Maysara, meaning Hafs ibn Maysara took from Zaid ibn Aslam as well. The third student, Hisham ibn Sa'ad, also narrated from Zaid ibn Aslam. The fourth student, Abdurrahman bin Ishaq, also took from Zaid ibn Aslam. And the fifth student, Mubarak ibn Mujahid, also narrated from Zaid ibn Aslam. And the sixth student, Kharija ibn Mus'ab, also narrated from Zaid ibn Aslam. Now, the other five students excluding Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal, I mean, they also narrated this hadith, as I said, going back through the route of Zaid bin Aslam, back to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, the famous companion. And all five of these students have not narrated it with the possessive form, his shin, rather a shin in conformity with the Quranic verse. The Quranic verse does not ascribe an attribute of shin, if you want to translate it literally, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only this version in Bukhari does through the route of Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal. So does that mean now that Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal has introduced something extra into the text or not? What do we call this introduction of an extra portion to the text? Idraj. His own wording has come into the text, number one. Number two, his version where he's added his saq is at odds with the other five students that we've mentioned who do not narrate it with the possessive form his saq. So therefore, what does that mean now? Sa'id bin Abi Hilal's version is Shaz, because he's generally trustworthy. Generally trustworthy, but he has erred by introducing slight different wording into the text. Though it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, from the principles of hadith, that portion with the wording his saq is not acceptable, because it's from himself and not from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, and not from the Prophet sallallahu how do we know further that Sa'id bin Abi Hilal has made this mistake? Because it appears, if we look at other books of hadith, in the Sahih of Ibn Hibban, volume 16, number 7377, you'll see the same hadith from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, through who? Through the root of Sa'id bin Abi Hilal himself, narrating the same hadith, but without affirming his saq. This is a conclusive proof that he used to narrate it in two ways. Sometimes he narrated it with his saq, and other times a saq. So therefore, this is a proof that he's introduced the extra possessive form, his saq, into the text that we find in Sahih al-Bukhari. And also in the Mustakhraj of Abu Awana, which is also available in print, through the root of Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal, again, it doesn't transmit it with the wording his saq, but a saq. 
And what is the best version of this hadith from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri? If you go back to Tahzeeb al-Tahzeeb of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, you know I've mentioned six students who took from Zaid ibn Aslam. One of them was Hisham ibn Sa'ad. Hisham ibn Sa'ad. His version is the strongest. Why? Because Imam Abu Dawud, the compiler of the Sunan, he's on record as saying that the firmest narrator, the best narrator taking from Zaid ibn Aslam, uh, of all of his students is Hisham ibn Sa'ad. He was the most strongest narrator in terms of precision in conveying the narration by heart or by the, the written format. So Hisham ibn Sa'ad didn't trans, transmit the narration with the wording his saq. So this is a proof that it's a shad narration and idraj has taken place that Sa'id bin Abi Hilal has introduced a portion to the actual hadith and it seems accidentally because Ahmad ibn Hanbal said that he sometimes would confuse his narration sometimes he would add things to the text or drop things from the text and let's quote Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in Fathul Bari the commentary to this hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari volume 8 664 page 664 and there has occurred in this place meaning regarding the hadith our Lord will reveal his saq and it is from the narration of Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal from Zaid bin Aslam as related by Al-Ismaili. Who is Al-Ismaili? Al-Ismaili is Imam Abu Bakr Al-Ismaili who died in 371 after the Hijrah. What he did, he went over Sahih al-Bukhari and compiled what's known as a Mustakhraj work. Continue, by Al-Ismaili, like that who then said, concerning his statement, his Saq, it is rejected, Nakara. Then he related from the root of Hafs ibn Maysara, which we find in Sahih Muslim and elsewhere, from Zaid ibn Aslam with the wording, a saq will be revealed. Al-Ismaili said, this is more authentic due to it being in agreement with the Quranic wording in totality. So this is a classic example from Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani and contemporary scholars who deny affirming an attribute called saq for Allah. This is the way they look at this narration that, yes, it's in Bukhari, and the most part of the text is authentically related by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. But this portion affirming a saq for Allah is not the wording of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. It's not from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It's from an era of one of the narrators and he is Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal who is generally trustworthy. But because he erred, his version of events on this portion to do with the saq is an idraj to the matan. And so therefore that portion is called Shad because he contradicts at least five other students. So this is Ibn Taymiyyah's proof and this is the way it's answered by, by contemporaries and people like Ibn Hajar have given strong evidence to show why it's rejected. In the famous printed editions of Sahih Bukhari that we have today, there's one narration that is missing showing that he did know of a different version from Sa'id ibn Abi Hilal saying not his Saq but a Saq. Okay, how do I know that? Because there is a book called Kitab al-Ru'ya by Imam al-Darakutni, available in print. In Kitab al-Ru'ya, Darakutni gives another version, going back to Sahih al-Bukhari, through Sa'id bin Abi Hilal, without the wording, his saq, but a saq. That hadith that Darakutni ascribed to Bukhari, is not found in the printed editions of uh, Sahih Bukhari today. Maybe not all of the manuscripts had this version, but Al-Darakutni, he lived relatively close to the time of Al-Bukhari. We're talking about a century in difference. So he must have had a recension of Sahih Al-Bukhari passed down to him with chain of transmission. That's how they got the hadiths. It wasn't just found in some market stall and said, yes, this is fine, this is Sahih Bukhari, like we, we have today. They would have these manuscripts passed down to them by hearing the text completely from the shuyukh, Yes, and having it authorized and authenticated by them as well, like some sort of stamp or the dot and the circle around the dot, that methodology would be utilized by them. And that, we know, occurred even after Darakutni's time. And people would go out of their way to travel hundreds, if not thousands of miles, just to get famous copies of certain books. For example, some of you may know of a famous female Hadith scholar from the 5th century by the name of Karima al-Marwaziya. So famous she was in transmitting Sahih al-Bukhari. The people like Khatib al-Baghdadi came all the way from Baghdad to Mecca to hear it from her. So you can see how arduous and striving people were in those days, even if it was from a female, unlike other religions. 
not to diminish the status of women, but unlike other religions, look at Christianity or Judaism, would these rabbis and priests go out of their way to hear the Bible from a female? I doubt it. Probably demeaning to them. But in Islam, there's no distinction. We know that the Sahaba used to go to Aisha radiallahu anha and take hadith from her and take clarification from her and others from the female companions.